Neighbor cut down several trees on my property, claiming they were a hazard. What do I do? With updates and a conclusion. Is this worth getting a lawyer over? I'm pretty ticked. So I moved into my current house about two years ago. It's a beautiful three acre property, mostly flat, except for about a dozen large trees bordering part of a road that runs alongside my property. I'm not sure what type they are, but they're pretty big. I think they're oaks? Well, I love them. They provide some great shade in the summer, during part of the day, and they're just pretty. My neighbor doesn't like them. He's not really my neighbor, since his house is quite a bit down the road, but he's the closest one to me. When I first moved in, he came over and introduced himself and asked if I planned to do anything about the trees. I was confused and I told him no. He told me a little bit before I moved in, one of the trees had a branch break off and fall into the road, causing an obstruction that lasted a whole day, according to him. He said the previous owner didn't care and did not cut down the trees, but he, the neighbor, hoped that I would. I told him that I would talk to the previous owner and see about it. I did that, and though it was two years ago, as I recall, the owner told me that he went out and moved the branch the moment he saw it. We talked a bit more, and I decided not to cut down the trees. Like I said, I like them. So I was away this past week and weekend visiting family for our annual reunion. I come back and honestly almost drove past my own house because I was so used to seeing the line of trees and they weren't there. He cut down all my trees. I immediately went and asked him, and he said that he had them removed due to being a hazard and that it was legal because the city signed off on it. I was livid, but I just left and told him to stay off of my property. There aren't even stumps, guys. They are completely gone. I asked my other neighbors, one who lives down the road the opposite way and another across the way, what had happened, and they said he had a company out there cutting them all down all week. One of them asked him about it, and apparently he showed them some document from the city that gave him permission to remove the trees. Is that true? Can he just remove my trees? Should I call a lawyer about this? Uh, call the city? I don't even know where to start. It's left that whole area of my property an ugly strip of dirt and loose earth. I know the trees are definitely on my property. The previous owner and real estate agent walked around with me and I remember them showing me the extent of the property. And it's not like the trees are right up against the road. The trunks were like 15 to 20 feet in from the road and were probably 15 feet apart. I'm not sure, but they stretched a pretty good amount along the road and some of the branches definitely hung over the road. What should I do? I also called the previous owner who was rather surprised to hear from me and told him what had happened. He was also ticked. He told me those trees had been there since before he bought the house 20 something years ago and he also told me what kind. He says they were white oaks but I'm going to go with what some people suggested and hire an arborist to come out. Now it should have been more clear that whoever removed the trees didn't take out all the stumps. I meant like the classic two foot stump wasn't there but they were trimmed down to like a few inches. Barely noticeable and there's a lot of loose dirt like they tried digging or something. I'm going to talk to the police tomorrow and see if I can talk to whoever's in charge of these matters with the city. Hopefully they can tell me if they gave permission to my neighbor or not. An update. This was a busy morning, but I think I'm on the right track. I know my neighbor is a little wealthy since he told me about a summer house that he has, but I don't know if he paid for this or what. So I went to the police first thing and asked to report trespassing and possible vandalism. The officer took down my story and I even brought him some photos, which he asked to keep. He then told me, and this kind of ticked me off, that unless I had proof of my neighbor cutting these trees down or giving authorization to cut them down, it may turn into my word against my neighbors. He suggested I just pursue this in court myself. Is he right? I don't want to question a police officer, but I want to be sure. While at the police station, I asked who I would talk to specifically with the city about permits and tree removals, and the officer told me to try the public works which matched what a user commented. So I went home and called them. The lady asked for my street address so she could check it against their records, and I did, and she found nothing. Not a single thing. She said there was nothing regarding my address or property in the last six weeks. I noted that and then thanked her. Then I called an arborist like many of you suggested and made an appointment for later this week. She, the arborist, also asked that I have some photos of the trees when she comes, which is fine since I have more. Finally, I looked up companies that do landscaping or logging and tree removal, covering all of my bases since I really don't know who would handle tree removal anywhere other than a forest. 
Anyways, after calling a few places, I got one who confirmed that they did the job and they told me that they were following a city order. That call was after I called the lady at the public works for the city and she told me there was no record of my address. Did my neighbor lie to this company? They didn't ask me for more details, and when I asked who showed them the order, they said they couldn't tell me. What? Is this true? I'm going to look up some law offices in my general area and reach out about all of this. Does this fall under a specific type of law office? Like, should I hire a specific lawyer? Sorry, I'm really out of my league here. I'll let you know what happens, though. The company was a tree service, by the way. Didn't even know that was a business type. They aren't exactly local, but they're relatively close by. They didn't tell me what happened to the trees either. This is the beginning from the end of my last update on the original post, which detailed how I went to the police, found the company that did the job, and called the city to find there was no permit issued or documentation related to my address. So I have called a lawyer. After some in-depth searching and a few calls, I've connected with a relatively local lawyer, I'm a bit rural, and we talked for about an hour. He wanted all the details I had, especially when I mentioned the arborist. He asked for the number and told me he was going to ask for additional information from the inspection that would be important for a lawsuit. He also gave me the number of a surveyor and told me that I should call them as soon as possible. He then set me up with an appointment at his offices next week after the arborist visit. As far as the criminal charges, he told me that was my call, but we could talk more about it next week. He did comment that making a police report was a smart move. Lastly, he told me not to contact the neighbor anymore to get a written and signed testimony from the witness neighbor and to report any documents in the mail from either my neighbor or the company that did the job, as well as refusing contact should the neighbor come to my door. I asked if I could continue updating you all and he said that was fine as long as I don't disclose personal information. So it looks like I'm taking my neighbor's butt to court. I hope somehow I can get my trees back even just having new ones planted. That area of my property is so barren now. Final update. I can't speak to all the details, and I'm sorry about not continuing to update, and after everything got underway, I figured it would be best not to. To keep it short, we, my lawyer and I, spoke to the police, who then spoke to the neighbors down and across the street, which is the one who witnessed my trees getting cut down, who stated they saw the neighbor and the company cutting down my trees. And then finally, they spoke to him, the neighbor, I don't know much beyond that with the criminal investigation, what happened with the whole city document or the company, and why that is will be explained below. I hauled his butt into court. Well, first the arborist came, as did the surveyor. The trees were on my property, and they were white oaks. The arborist gave me an estimate on having 15 mature white oaks brought and replanted on my property, which was just shy of $650,000 though he did say that some trees would die and that would drive the cost up. I also had my property appraised for the difference before and after losing my trees. It then became a question of whether I wanted to pursue my lost trees and see how much their lumber was worth or sue for the replacement cost and loss of property value. Basically, do I want the trees back or do I want the cost of the ones I lost? Apparently, you can't have both. Well guys, I picked the trees. The actual court stuff started a lot sooner than I thought. We filed, a few weeks passed, and a few days before our day in court, his lawyer reached out with a settlement offer. Apparently, he was wealthier than I thought. We accepted, and while I can't speak to the details of it, I'm getting the trees back. It's going to take a long time, apparently, several months, possibly all the way until September, since the process didn't start until just this week due to the holidays, but I will have all 12 trees back on my property at no cost to me. My neighbor has also put his house up for sale and I haven't seen him for quite some time now. Oh well, there's a bit more to the settlement but I don't feel comfortable speaking to that. Hopefully that's understandable. I remember some of the comments about whether the trees were a hazard to the road based on how far they were from the road and I ended up having to check with the county, not the city, and they sent someone out to measure and mark the boundaries. My trees were at least five feet beyond it, so outside the boundary. Not even close. Would have you done the same thing as OP, standing up for yourself, getting the lawyer involved, and winning this fight? HOA raising fees for non-members not in the HOA. Check out this video in podcast form by searching Austin Stories wherever you listen, or check the video description for a link. Quick backstory. About 40 years ago and before my time, easement holders, EH, and the local HOA got into a very expensive lawsuit that was about to go off the rails. 
It was super petty too. Easement holders in the HOA families telling their kids not to play with each other. HOA then added locks to different areas for security and issued keys to both members and easement holders and then randomly changing the locks without issuing new keys to the easement holders. They're pushing the boundary of what the easement allowed, stuff like that. And when the bills for the lawyers came back and how expensive it was getting, the two opposing parties came to a compromise. The holders pay the basic upkeep fees. The HOA allows the holders to partake in HOA events. For every five boat slips available, holders got two, and both sides back off the petty stuff. This was written out, but never signed by both parties. And everything was fine for almost 40, 40 freaking years. Little spats here and there, but nothing too outrageous. Recently, the HOA board members that struck the deal have resigned for one reason or another, death being the most common reason. Newer board members came in and started changing things up. They started enforcing obscure rules that haven't been enforced in years and making up new ones. One of the new ones was that the holders were no longer allowed at board meetings unless they, easement holders, were specifically on the agenda. And since most HOA members were friendly with the EH or holder families, the board decided that certain board meetings were to be board members only. And you guessed it, most meetings were now special sessions. And now the original unsigned agreement that has been ignored and a new one was written that the holders had to abide by all the HOA regulations or lose privileges. Enter G. G was a city boy who dove deep into the country style living even though the area was now considered a suburb. Moved out there full time and decided to really improve his property. G added a very nice barn style shed for his stuff. He got several violation notices in the mail about how it wasn't an approved style shed and the color was not an approved color, even though the color matched his house. G has money and he paid for a lawyer to get involved to remind them that he is not a part of the HOA. G gets another violation, accusations of keeping farm animals in the barn and they were causing a nuisance. The lawyer gets involved again and this time informs the HOA that the area is partially zoned for certain livestock. G now proceeds to get a couple of chickens and a goat. Cops are called this time on a tip that G had a rooster and they're not zoned for them. While G did have a rooster, local laws say that he is allowed just one. He countersues for harassment and wins. He gets another violation, this time about his dogs. G regularly brought his dogs to the beach. He wasn't the only one as most people in the area did and would regularly bring them down to swim and exercise, even other board members. G was informed that he lost his boat slip for repeated violations of various rules. Didn't matter that anyone else was doing the same. Considering what the HOA insurance policy said about the beach, after 5 feet of depth, the swimming area was supposed to be off limits. Just so happens there's a floating dock that used to be for the swimming area, but now not because of said insurance policy. That is where he decides to put it. Back to court they go. The issue is currently unresolved. But as bills and fees went out in January, like they usually do, there's a special assessment fee added for the holders. Comparing the bills with a friendly HOA member, they did not get the same fee. Looks like they're trying to get the holders to pay for the bills that G is causing because G has deep pockets. The HOA has come out before saying that if they dissolved and sold to the town, that any holders claim on the property gets super diluted to the point that it's worthless. Not sure if this is an empty threat or something else. Some of the holders and boat owning HOA members have been trying to get an estimate from the board on how much it would be to buy out the beaches. The HOA board just responds with that the holders can't afford their asking price, even though they haven't given a price. Is there something legal you can do? Yeah, sue them, take them on down because you're not in the HOA, unfair fees, unfair rules, and holding on to them. Uh, this is just a mess. What would have you done? Some of the most obnoxious people I've ever met. I just need to get this off my chest. I have this neighbor, or set of neighbors I should say, who are so loud and obnoxious and disruptive that I always have to have some sort of music or TV playing to drown them out. Living above one of them, I always walk on my tiptoes, has to be as quiet as possible. I don't slam doors or cupboards, I keep music low unless I have to deal with the one outside. Neighbor number one literally sits on the porch all day and all night, smoking the funny. That's whatever. Sometimes it gets into my apartment, but it's only when the wind's blowing backwards. But what I don't freaking like is when he's out there tweaking and yelling at the top of his lungs about some imaginary crap because he's greening out or laughing at three in the morning for the whole complex to hear. And as a side effect to this guy never putting down the stuff, I'm assuming, he constantly blows snot rockets off of his porch audibly and all day and all night again. 
It's muffled and quieter indoors, but you can still hear them if there's low volume music with the windows closed. You can hear it on the other side of the building too. And he does it when people are hanging out at the pool and everyone stares at him. Like, do you have any decency or are you just out there to tick everyone off trying to enjoy themselves? He also slams his door as hard as possible, which makes my front door rattle along with the wall, and I just think to myself, what a toddler, doesn't know how to blow his nose, screaming at all times during the night and slamming things around. This and his crappy music he blasts with the subwoofers that come up through the floor, which should be illegal. I would sign anything on the planet if it meant banning subwoofers from apartment buildings. Neighbor number two isn't even close to being as bad as number one, he hasn't even been making that much noise up until recently. The thing that ticks me off with them is sometimes they'll blast Joe Rogan or some crappy doc show and I'll hear it through my wall. Or recently, they keep scraping something along the floor around 8 a.m. It sounds like an armoire filled with bricks and it's woken me up a few times because I stay up late because it's the only time where I can get peace and quiet for a few hours. When they move whatever this thing is, it makes the wall rumble hard and I can feel it through my pillow. It hasn't happened in a while though, or maybe I just don't realize it anymore because I moved my bed to a different room to get away from them. At a few points, I've considered looking into nuisance neighbor laws, and number one definitely fits the bill for it for being an annoyance to the community because everyone can hear him and smell what he's doing. I don't really care about number two that much because he rarely makes any noise, but I'm not going to pursue the nuisance neighbor laws because I'm going to be going out of here in a few months and I feel like if he can make a little noise, so can I. Which I don't, but I'm also on the top level, so I'm not sure how much of me walking around transfers down there as sound. And as a plus, he keeps addicts and other people away from hanging out in the area because he annoys the heck out of them too. And I also feel like it would make it way worse with the nuisance neighbor law if he was forced to do all of his annoying crap inside instead of outside, which he would probably just move inside to do it after getting fined. I cannot wait to move to a nicer complex or a place with an HOA that jumps on people that are disruptive to others every single day. Yeah, thankfully you're getting out of there soon so you don't have to deal with it much longer, but interesting you talk about going to an HOA. You know, they're supposed to be good, but who? Power corrupts strongly. With great power comes great responsibility, right? You know who said that? Let me know. My neighbor is costing me a lot of money. What would you do? I'm not sure how building regulations work in other countries, but here's our story. My husband and I moved into our house September 2023. We were renting a storage unit for some extra things. The house came without a garage, so December, my husband hired contractors to build one so that we can give up the storage unit and put our things in there. Building regulations in our country state that you cannot build on the borderline of your yard without your neighbor's consent. The builders clearly understood us wrong because they built on the borderline when they should have built two and a half meters from it. We thought, okay, no problem, we'll just apply for permission with new plans. The lady behind us had other plans. So she already called the necessary authorities and then complained, even before they finished building. My husband went to talk to her and she said that she thought it was an apartment, that's why she complained, but if it's a garage, we can continue. Unfortunately, the damage was already done and she already caused trouble for us. We had to pay big fines, redo the building plans, have an engineer come and do an inspection and so on. On top of that, a week later, she denied saying that we could continue and said that she said to first get the plans approved and then continue, which is a lie. The authorities gave us permission papers to have all our neighbors sign. This woman told my husband that she doesn't want us in her yard so that we can leave the letter in her postal box and then she'll fill it in. This morning, we find out from her that she went directly to the authorities, denied us permission, and complained some more. This was the final straw for us. We're about to become the neighbors from heck. Give me some ideas just to bother her, not the rest of our neighbors because we love them. She's also got a building on our borderline of our yard, against our yard, so I don't understand what the problem is. The builders did a really great job and it looks very neat. It doesn't obstruct any view for her or anything. My husband said he's going to pour salt water on that building's roof every day so that it can rust. Yeah, I mean, if the builders mess something up even if they did a good job, if they got the idea wrong or the construction wrong, talk to them. Or take care of this Karen. What would you do? Oh, this HOA story is so good. It's called... I planted bamboo that overran my neighbor's property over a security light. 
About four years ago, I used to live in a nice HOA in a small town in Texas and enjoyed having only one neighbor over my backyard fence. The plot was about two acres and the other side of the backyard butted up to a hayfield. The stars were beautiful at night because of virtually no light pollution. Until the neighbor decided to install an incredibly bright security light over their back porch, aimed right at my back patio and bedroom windows. I tried to ignore it at first and put shades in the bedroom, but out on the patio, it was like having a bright LED headlight in your face all night. I consulted the HOA about adding a privacy addition to my fence to increase its height and they said no because it's already at the 8 foot max allowed height. They said there was nothing in the bylaws or whatever about bright lights, so nothing they could do. So I hated for this to be the thing where we finally had a formal greeting after three years of back porch waves, but I walked over and rang the doorbell with $20. I politely explained how the light was causing the aforementioned nuisance and asked if there was any way that I could convince him to point the light down or in a different direction, and even offered to buy him a case of beer, the 20 bucks, out of goodwill, and even a new motion sensing light. He seemed nice and agreed to point it down, but after waiting a month, nothing changed. I went back to have another polite conversation and he said that he had changed his mind and was going to leave it on every night and leave it pointed as is. Petty Revenge Time Needless to say, I was a bit upset that diplomacy had failed and started figuring out how to win. If the military taught me anything, there's always ways to adapt and overcome. So I started researching fast-growing plants to create big privacy walls and reading through the HOA bylaws and the city and state ordinances about what I could or couldn't plant and if there were any repercussions for encroachment across the property line. I quickly discovered running bamboo, despite being very invasive, would grow super fast to make the neighbor's house and light disappear from view, and there was nothing on the HOA state and city books to prevent me from planning it or cause legal recourse if it spread and grew on his side of the fence. The only thing he could do is cut anything that grew on his side of the line. So I pulled the trigger and planted a bunch of golden bamboo, which grows and spreads crazy fast in Texas and grows up to 20 feet tall. I didn't care if it took over the fence line because his house is 15 feet from the fence while mine was 50 yards away. So I planted a bunch right against the fence and only put root barrier on my side to prevent it spreading into my yard. Within six months, his house and light were gone from view, replaced by a pretty bamboo jungle row at the edge of my yard. Within one year, he complained that it was growing into his yard via mailed letters, and they went right into the trash with no response. He rang my doorbell once, and I looked at him through the window, but just didn't answer the door. I unexpectedly sold my house and moved two years after planting for a career opportunity. It's been two years since I sold and I just checked the property on Google Earth and his entire backyard is bamboo. Oh, this is funny. As someone who has dealt with bamboo, this is almost nuclear revenge. And you should mail him a stuffed panda and a flashlight with a card that says, thinking of you, unsigned and with no return address. I think this is great because it seems so innocuous and innocent and then over time it's one of those ticking time bomb long plays, right? Then OP just takes the win in a creative way that you can't see coming at first. What would have you done? My grandma who raised me offered to help me buy a house and stepbrother's girlfriend is upset by it. So my grandma raised me since I was two years old because I got taken away from my parents. I never knew my mother so I called her mom. She didn't really help me a lot as an adult unless I was really desperate. She's a lot older now and I kind of think she wants to make it right with me before it's her time. So my dad, my grandma's son, ended up having a lot of other kids with his girlfriend that they didn't take good care of. My dad was a drug addict so a lot of those kids followed him and became addicts or criminals themselves. His girlfriend had four kids before she hooked up with my dad. 
Anyway, my stepbrother, we'll call him Nick, has just been in and out of jail like almost his whole life. He met this girl, and she seems like a good girl. We'll call her Kim. Kim is keeping Nick out of trouble. I thought I was bonding a friendship with Kim and gave Nick a second chance. Me and my husband had them out to our house and fed them dinner. My grandma invited them to Christmas and she cooked dinner and always treated Kim good, even when Nick was in jail. I even came to her apartment 45 minutes away on my only day off work to help her clean her apartment when she had surgery. It was bad too. I took like 12 bags of garbage out of her apartment and I was there cleaning for like 5 hours, for free, just to help her. So Nick finally made it out of jail right before Christmas. I listened to Kim vent about him being in jail many times. I felt bad for her because I thought that she had no one else. Fast forward, I'm currently trying to get a mortgage to get a house of my own and stop renting. I told my grandma that I didn't know if I would get it because I didn't have enough for a down payment. She told me that she would help me. I told her, well, thank you, but I feel bad to take from her. Of course, I will be paying her back at tax time, so I probably only need it for a month or two. Thinking Kim was my friend, I ended up telling her that my grandma said that she would help me. She got all mad about it and said that she wouldn't help them with money for a car. They just got approved for a car and they want her to help them with the second car for him so that he can work. I didn't know that they asked her for money. So I never had a criminal record or went to jail. I have full intentions of paying my grandma back in a couple of months. I have two kids, her grandchildren, who she loves very much. Plus, she is like my mom. I think Kim is acting really entitled. Nick doesn't even have a job yet either. I'm thinking of keeping my distance from her at this point. I honestly don't care that much for the friendship, but I'm kind of hurt that she would be mad about my grandma helping me out. She has only been with Nick for a couple of years. You're responsible. Nick is not. Yeah, I mean, it'd be great if Nick had a chance, but he has shown time and again that he does not do it. I mean, you have to want the help. You cannot make someone, I've learned this the hard way, get help if they don't want it. That's the tricky part. What would have you done? As we get into the next story, I have to tell you something. Hey, also, I added more stories to the new 24-7 HOA care and radio stream on the channel. Perfect to binge or play for background noise while you sleep. Check out the link in the description or on the front page of the channel. It looks like this. Diva Chef told me just stand there and be quiet. Okay, by Artful Dodger 1431. Here's some background. Let me take you into my past. Again, I'm in the kitchen of a large culinary company, catering company. You get these more often than most, a diva in the kitchen. Could be a cook, a chef, or someone with a lot of attitude. Let me introduce you to Chef Smokey, and the reason will be explained in a moment. At the time, he was a line cook with some attitude issues. He had just joined on with us, and he acted like he was going to be the next top chef in this company. He came over to our main line, looked things over, and then he came to the prep zone. Now, the difference in the prep zone and the main line is the type of burners. On the main line, we have gas ranges, six in fact, and in the prep zone, we have almost all L-shaped counters with induction burners set up. On unusually swamp nights, the prep zone will handle appetizers for the main line. So here comes Chef Smokey about to take the lead on appetizers. Myself and one other person are working hard, but apparently not smart enough. So Chef Smokey grabs multiple pans and puts them on the induction burners. He revs them up super high and adds his olive oil. Now, there are two glitches in this scenario. Issue one, induction burners, these older ones, use specific pans and they have a special setup to work. So they can be a little temperamental when they do work. And if you use the wrong pan, either the pan won't work or they act up. Issue two, is that olive oil smokes faster than normal canola or vegetable oil or the mixed oil that we have on site. The recipe calls for olive oil. We don't pump our induction burners to super high, especially when you're using pans not made for it. Because, well, the pans work, but they can run super hot. They can overload the induction burner, or they might not just work at all. He sprays oil into all five pans that he has on super high. He gives us a super conceited look. I say, you might not wanna, Chef Smokey says, I zip it. But you seriously might not w Just be quiet and watch. With all due respect, you, and I reach to lower the settings on the induction and he nearly spanks my hand. Just stand there and be quiet. The malicious compliance. Okay, learn the hard way, I think. Chef Smokey starts his first pan, dropping his appetizer to cook. It comes out great, but as he reaches for his second pan, the oil has already instant burned. Pan three, four, five are also burned oil. They're smoking. So being a resilient, smart, and problem solving human he is, he wipes the pans and sprays oil in them. Oil instant burns. Okay, so he tries a new tactic. 
Chef Smokey drops oil and then he drops the appetizer material at the same moment. <laughs> nice try. His appetizer instant burns because his oil was already burned quick. He goes through this cycle about three times of burning product pretty fast. He is getting raging PO'd. So I try to stop him, but he's got to try one last time. He burns it again. He lays his oil in his pans again and I lean in and say, uh, Hey, Smokey the Bear, your oil's burning again. The aftermath. Chef Smokey backs off. Then it's each man to a pan, heat turned to a moderate level. While Chef Smokey starts the reprep of the lost product he's burned through, let me note that he burned through most of the day's product, so he was going to spend the day reprepping. He spent a good day silent. The guys in the kitchen used my nickname and I gave him, and some called him Smokey the Bear, some called him Chef Smokey, and it stuck until he quit. Customer asked me to count out a bag of live crickets in front of her, loses out on bonus crickets. Posted by Albino Raven 666 I, 32 year old female, work part time at a pet store to supplement my income as my salary of my full time teacher doesn't always pay the bills. Plus, I have a few pets and 20% off of in store purchases is rather helpful. Anyway, one of the things that we supply are live and frozen feeder animals for things like reptiles, certain aquatic creatures, and invertebrates. These include things like mice and rats to buy roaches, bloodworms, mealworms, waxworms, superworms, and crickets. The mice and the rats are either frozen or live, but either way they're easy to count and box up for the customer. To buy roaches, mealworms, waxworms, and superworms are prepackaged and price marked, but the crickets are not. Crickets are kept in these large containers with mesh top egg cartons for the crickets to climb and hide in, cricket food, and hydration. This means that when the customers ask for crickets, which we usually sell by the dozen, we have to count and retrieve them manually while putting them in a plastic bag that we then fill with air and then tie off to go to the customer. Our method for transferring the crickets is to lightly tap the egg cartons over a funnel-like object that doesn't have a hole at the bottom. We tap the crickets in, wrap the plastic bag around the mouth of the funnel, then tip it and lightly tap the crickets into the bag. Some crickets jump in out of order or cling to others, so often customers are given bonus crickets, which we're okay with, it's better than shorting them. So customers are always given the right amount or often more than what they asked for without an increase in price. Most people get this. The customer in the story did not. A woman comes in and she asked for four dozen crickets, 48 crickets total. I went to the back, tapped the crickets from the cartons into the funnel and then counted them into the bag. As per usual, the occasional extra cricket tumbled or hopped in, probably putting the total to a bit over 50 by the time I was done. So I bagged them, tied the bag, and then I took them to the counter. Now, I don't know if this woman was having a bad day or if she'd been stiffed by another store in the past, but she demanded that we count out the crickets in front of her before she pays for them. Now, I explained that this was likely that she got a little more than what she asked for and that counting out 48 crickets individually would take a little while. She insisted and wanted to be sure that we weren't, quote, ripping her off, end quote. So, I got one of those small plastic critter keepers and a pair of tongs. I opened the bag making it deflate and slightly more painful to work with, and inserted the tongs. Delicately so, not to crush the crickets, I grabbed each one with the tongs and started counting slowly so to not crush the crickets with the tongs or to lose my place while counting, which is something I do struggle with. Then I dropped each individually counted cricket into the critter keeper. So after about five to 10 minutes at the counter, meticulously counting crickets with tongs and maybe deliberately taking a little bit longer than I had to out of spite, a line was building up behind the woman and I was getting close to the end of my count. Eventually, I hit the grand total of what she paid for, 48 crickets. And wouldn't you believe it, there were 10 left over in the bag. Almost a whole extra free dozen that she would have gotten had she not asked me to count. I said, oh, would you look at that? My mistake. You were right. I did miscount. I'll put these other ones back and ring you up for the 48. I'll be right back. And before she could protest, I wandered off to dump the last 10 crickets back into the cricket container. When I came back to check her out, she was silent not looking at me. She did her best to ignore the irritated looks of the customers lining up behind her while I poured her 48 crickets back into a plastic bag. She paid and then slunk off sheepishly out the door without a thank you or a glance back. I then got through the rest of the line quickly and apologized to the customers in line for the wait. I sent them home with some free samples, thanked them for their patience, and then continued along with my shift. She never complained and she did return to the location several times after. She never asked anyone to count crickets again. Just undo that knot, posted by Application Mobile 492. When I was a teenager, I spent my summers visiting my mom on one side of the country, and every other year, her mom, my Grammy, on the other side of the country. Grammy usually had some project that needed doing, like cleaning gutters or fixing a fence, yeah, things like that. This story is from when she wanted some trees to chop down. Volunteer trees, the kind that grow tall and fast, but not thick. 
They're easily handled with a hacksaw and or hatchet if one knows what they're doing. As will become apparent, I was not qualified for that description. Grammy hired a neighborhood teen to help out, and the two of us tackled the first and smallest of the three trees. This was when I learned that I was the most qualified of the two of us, so I was in charge of planning. Shockingly, the first tree went smoothly, and we learned how well that we worked together. Second tree, no problems. We're feeling like we have a handle on things. We get to the third tree, and just like we did before, we tied a rope towards the top of the tree and tied it off to an old stump to guide the tree or to prevent an accident, and we got to work chopping into the trunk of the tree. We realized we had a problem when the rope went tight. Backing off to assess the situation, we were a little baffled how the tree started falling the way it did, but accepted that, if not for the rope, we would have just dropped this tree onto the nearby fence and Grammy's truck just beyond it. As we were discussing how to get the tree to fall the direction we wanted, Grammy came out to see what the holdup was. We get as far as pointing out the rope when she utters the line. Oh, I see the problem. You used the wrong type of knot. You needed a slip knot so you could tighten it up as you went. No, no, that's not the problem. The problem is, here, undo that knot. I'll show you how to tie a proper knot. Nothing we could say could dislodge that idea that we just needed a proper knot. So, confirming what had happened the next was directly Grammy's fault. We undid the knot. The knot that was holding up a whole tree. Grammy was halfway into the first step of whatever knot she wanted us to tie before she realized why we weren't listening to her. All three of us watched as this tree fell nice and slow onto the fence. With a mighty crack, the trunk separated from the stump and the tree continued tipping directly onto the roof of Grammy's truck. Silence. Then, finally realizing what we had tried to tell her, Grammy lets out a hearty laugh. <laughs> okay, I was wrong. Now finish the job and get the tree off my car. Want me to cook your steak a little longer than everyone else's? Okay. Posted by Amadeus Jericho. Let me start this off by saying I am crappy at cooking steak. Not this isn't edible anymore bad, but accidentally over or undercooked it bad. I can never get that perfect medium rare, and if I do, it's a dang miracle. Everyone in my household likes medium rare steaks, as I'm sure many people do. Most of the time, I end up undercooking them, which isn't a big deal, because I can just cook them a little longer. However, it seems to go from rare to well done in a very short amount of time. I don't know if the steak gods hate me or what. My mom always brings up my bad steak cooking skills, and it kind of peeves me off. I'm just trying my best, and no one else in the family complains. Just her. Now, before anyone says, why doesn't your mom cook, or why can't she make her own food? My mom is disabled, and she can barely stand long enough to make a sandwich without being in a lot of pain. My brother and dad work all day, so I'm the only one left to cook dinner every night. It's been this way for years. And yes, even though I've been cooking for years, I still can't perfect a steak. Anyway, today I was making steak for dinner. I was very confident that today would be the day that I get a perfect medium rare. As I was just finishing up the steaks, my mom chimes in with, can you cook mine a little longer than the rest of them from the living room? Now, today is just an off day for me. I don't know why, I just don't have the best mood today, and I've got a little PO'd that she asked me that, because I guess she would just assume that I'm going to make it too rare for her. She wants it to be cooked longer? Fine. I take two of the steaks off the heat to rest while I keep hers cooking. As I'm pre-cutting my steak, I like it pre-cut, don't judge me, I notice something. Could it be? The perfect medium rare that I've been dreaming of? Yes, yes, it's perfect. A perfect medium rare. I was delighted. After I'd finished cutting my steak, I take my mom's steak off the heat to rest. I wasn't going to completely butcher this steak because it was a very nice cut of steak and I wouldn't want to ruin it, so it's still very juicy. But as I was cutting her steak, again, because she's disabled, I see that it was definitely well done. In the end, when I served it up, I told her, ah, too bad you wanted yours cooked longer. Yours is now well done instead of medium rare like the rest. I unfortunately didn't get the reaction I was hoping for as she seemed pretty content with it. But I hope she stops asking me now. You don't want us to cook? Alrighty then, posted by Pardon This Name's Taken. I've been thinking about posting this story for a while and it just decided to commit. It brings a smile to my face, so here goes. When my brother and I were younger, 10 and 12, our parents had a rule that, other than using the microwave, we could not cook without a parent present. We can prep what we wanted to cook, but we were not to so much as touch that stove or oven. We tried it once and got fussed at. That's all it took. One summer, he and I wanted to make home fries, but our mother was at work and our father had just stepped out to do errands. I want to make home fries. Wait, wait a minute. Pardon, mom and dad said that we couldn't cook when they're not here. Now, let me interject with a little context about me. I was a smart aleck kid, and it got me in trouble often. 
so the inner workings of my mind on this day were bent toward mischief. They didn't say we couldn't cut it up though. Wonder Twin malicious compliance activate. We then went to work and then peeled and cut up and seasoned the potatoes before putting them in a bowl, covering the bowl with foil and placing it in the fridge. My brother and I looked at each other and said, wouldn't it be funny if dad came home and ate raw potatoes but said they were good even though they were raw? Now for a little more context, my dad was notorious for going into the refrigerator and eating whatever food he felt like eating regardless of whose it was. We laughed hysterically at the thought for about 10 minutes before going back to play Sega. About two hours go by and then my dad came home. As expected, he went to the refrigerator and pulled out the bowl of raw potatoes. We heard the rustle of the foil and immediately went to the kitchen to watch what he was going to do. He ate a potato and said, Oh, this is raw. It, it tastes good though, but why didn't you cook it? We reminded him that he said we couldn't cook if there wasn't a parent in the house. He chuckled and got out the skillet. That rule didn't last much longer in the house and he began teaching us how to cook more. HOA declares my new house is in the HOA, but no, it's not in the HOA. Click the video on your screen so you find out what happens to the house and I'll see you there.